All right, well, there in Exodus chapter 14. Uh, before we get started this evening, keep your place in Exodus 14. We're going to be there throughout the sermon. Uh, but turn your Bibles a couple pages back to Exodus 12, just to get a little bit of the context of where we're at here. Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. The context of where we're at in Exodus 12 is God has just done, uh, is, we're looking at the time of the ten plagues. And this right now is the final plague. God has done all these plagues through Moses, and Pharaoh will not let the people go. Pharaoh will not let them go. He'll change his mind. He'll let them go, and then he'll change his mind. And finally, God tells Moses, you know what, that's it. I'm going to do one more. And here we have the tenth plague, in the, it, which is the death of the firstborn, where everybody who did not follow God's instructions for the Passover had their firstborn die, the firstborn of every animal and of everyone who did not follow God's instructions. Uh, Exodus 12, verse 29 the Bible says, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go Serve the Lord, as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. Skip down to verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men, beside children. So just men was 600,000 alone, excluding women and children. Verse 38, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. So finally, after 430 years in Egypt, the Hebrews are free. They have been in bondage and slavery in Egypt for 430 years, and finally they are leaving. God has uh, delivered them. Look at, flip back to Exodus 14. We'll start in verse number 5. Exodus 14, 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot, and took his people with him. And he took six hundred chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and kept them over every one of them. So he, every single chariot that is in the land of Egypt, he takes to go pursue after the Hebrews, and on top of that, six hundred special chariots. And we see why this happened. Verse 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamping by the sea, beside Pehiroth before Belzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and noticed this, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. So they, they leave Egypt, and I'm sure, I think of this, I'm sure it was a spirit much of like when someone gets saved, how you're finally free from bondage and you're starting something new. And they look, and Pharaoh is coming after them, and a, a very large number of people, I would imagine. The title of the sermon this evening is The Light, the Darkness, and the God in Between. I'd like to just give you three statements or three lessons we can learn from this story in Exodus chapter 14. So first tonight, don't let pressure from the world make you regret separating from it. Let's keep reading in verse number 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? And, and don't miss their response here. And keep in mind, these are people who have seen God pr performing miracles that the world had not seen. God performing miracles and plagues upon Egypt that no one had ever seen before. Verse 12, it says, uh, notice what the response is, For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So not only are they just afraid and scared, which can happen to any of us, but they actually regret even leaving Egypt to begin with. Their first hardship in their journey occurs, and they instantly regret their decision. Turn to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. If you're familiar with the, a lot of the major prophets or even the minor prophets in the Bible, uh, Egypt is often a picture of the world. It's a picture of the unsaved world, the, word, the world without God. 
And like I said, the first lesson tonight is don't let pressure from the world make you regret separating from it. That's exactly what the Hebrews did here. There in Psalm 42, let's keep, start reading in verse 3. The Bible says this, My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So the author here is obviously being pressured by the world. Obviously, there's people around him who are mocking him, saying, Where is thy God? And the response is not regret. The response is not, I shouldn't have separated, I shouldn't have been so different from the world. The response is, I shall yet praise him. And this hope and this faith that continues. You're there in Psalm 42, just flip a couple pages over to Psalm 44. Psalm 44. We'll start reading in verse number 10. Psalm 44, 10. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy, and they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat, and hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. So the, the theme of this psalm here is someone being attacked by the world and pressured by the world. Uh, and we're, notice the response here. We'll keep reading. Verse 13, Thou makest a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn, and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. Look at verse 16, For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. So there's obviously a lot of haters of God, a lot of people from the world that are pressuring whoever is writing this psalm and it, it's uh, being reproached by these people. But notice the response from the author here. Verse 17, All this is come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee. Neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. And here we have verse 18. Verse 18 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. And especially as Christians in a church like this, in a church that believes in separation and separating from the world and being different, hard times and persecution, they're going to come whether it's from unsaved family or people you work with or just people around you, it, it, the more separated you are and the more you are doing for God, the more pressure and attacks that will come from the world. Turn to 1 Samuel 14. While you're turning to 1 Samuel 14, I want to read to you 2 Timothy 4.16, where the Apostle Paul is kind of, uh, towards the end of his life, just recapping his life a little bit and talking about different people and those who did him right and those who did him wrong. And he says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I think if there's anyone who spent their whole life being attacked by the world viciously, it was the Apostle Paul. His whole life, from the moment he gets saved to the end of his life, people are coming after him and trying to kill him and trying to stop what he's trying to do. And yet, he doesn't regret it. He's not at the end of his life regretting all the, the attacks that he spent his life going through. He's at the end of his life here and he says, but you know what? God stood with me. And God strengthened me, and even though he doesn't know, he talks about even in the future, he says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. He says, I don't know how it's going to end up, I don't know what's going to happen, but God has been strengthening me, and he will strengthen me. And he says, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. So he's saying, even if that just means I get to go to heaven, God is taking care of me through this. There's no regret from the Apostle Paul here. We learn First Samuel 14, uh, for sake of time, we won't read the whole story, but the context is Saul is king right now, and Israel is at war with the Philistines. And to make matters worse, they are greatly outnumbered. It's a giant army they're facing. And to make matters even worse, nobody has a sword. Here they're going up the, against this great multitude of people. They're extremely outnumbered, and no one except for Saul and his son Jonathan has a sword. And everybody is hiding as well. So it's a pretty bad situation. First Samuel 14, we'll start reading in verse 1 says, Now it came to pass on a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Skip down to verse 6. 
Verse 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over into the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For, and, and notice what he says here. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thine heart. So even at a time where they are greatly outnumbered, the chances are greatly against them, and everybody is hiding, by the way. So it's not even like he's going up against this, these Philistines, and he has a bunch of people behind him supporting him. He's the only one. Besides this young man who's his own bearer, he is all alone in this, and yet he, he has unfaltered faith. He still says here, it may be. And I love that phrase, because he, he's, he's not playing God and, and claiming what God's will is. He's saying, if God wants to, if it's God's will, he is able to deliver us out of this. And I think about this a lot when Jesus will talk, would talk about praying. And he says, when you, when you pray, believe that you have those things you pray for. I don't necessarily that mean, think that means we need to play God and, and just figure out what God's will is. I think that's just talking about having the faith to know that whatever God's will is, he is 100% able to do that. And that's what Jonathan is saying here. He's saying, if God wants to, if it's God's will, there is no restraint for him to do this. And of course, we know what ends up happening. They go, and, and God saves Israel because of Jonathan and his faith. Turn to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. Not only does Jonathan not regret uh, his position in separating from the world, but he knows that God is able to deliver him. You're there in Revelation 2. Uh, we're talking here in Revelation 2, this is Jesus Christ talking to the seven churches of Asia and telling them things he likes about them, things he doesn't like, things he wants them to change. Verse number 1, Revelation 2, 1 says this, And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And notice verse 3 here. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Here he's acknowledging that the church of Ephesus is laboring a lot, and they're, they're going through a lot, and they're, they're having to bear a lot, but he, he commends them for not fainting, for sticking through it, even with the pressure that comes. I mean, what a God that Jesus could say this about this church, that even if in the future we go through hard things or we're maybe going through persecution or trials, what a God that Jesus could say, you know, so-and-so Baptist church, Verity Baptist church in Fresno, they're going through a lot, and they're having to bear a lot and deal with a lot, but they have not fainted even a, a small bit. Okay. And not only as a church, but would God Jesus could say that about you? Is we all go through, through things in our personal lives that try to shake us. Would to God that Jesus could say, so-and-so went through a lot and they dealt with a lot, but they did not faint. They didn't stop. They didn't let it slow them down. Amen. You're there in Revelation 2. Look at verse 8. Here we're talking about the church in Smyrna. Revelation 2.8, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive, I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which, is, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Here Jesus is acknowledging that they're going through a lot. He says, I know it's hard. I know you're going, there's a lot of work. I know there's a lot of tribulation. I know you're having to fight different people who are trying to stop you. I know you've gone through a lot, but be faithful. Stay faithful. Be faithful even unto death, he says. Because the, what's the key to not quitting on God? What's the key to not being like the Hebrews and regretting leaving the world? What's the key to not quitting when the world attacks? It's being faithful. The word faithful means loyal, constant, and steadfast. For example, if you were to talk about somebody who, was, who worked for a company and say so-and-so has been a loyal employee for many years, that means that he's been there for a long time. That means he's a loyal employee. He's, he's a faithful employee. And it's the same way with God. If you're a faithful Christian, you don't quit on God. 
You look at verse 13, Revelation 2.13. Jesus goes on to say, I know thy works, where, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Typus my faithful martyr, who is slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Why was Antipas called faithful? It's because even until the point where he was martyred, even until the point where he died for the cause of Christ, he did not have that regret. He held fast the name of Jesus Christ even unto his death. He was faithful unto the very end. Turn to Psalm 31. Psalm chapter 31. While you're turning there, I'll read you Psalm 12, 1. That says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Not just in church life and among Christians, but just in general in our world today, there's a shortage of faithful people. In every aspect of life, whether it's, it's uh, just pe maybe people who are your friend or people who uh, you work with, nobody is faithful anymore. It's a, it's a major, major character flaw of our society today. Nobody is faithful. And especially in church life, in, among Christians, everybody sees the Egyptians and wants to go back. They still regret uh, separating. There's a, there's a shortage of faithful people. You're there in Psalm 31. The Bible says this, O love the Lord, verse 23, Psalm 31, 23, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye the hope in the Lord. God promises you that if you're faithful and you stick with it, when those hard times in your life come, he's going to strengthen you. He's going to preserve you, and he'll reward you. If you don't quit on God and you stay strong, God is going to preserve you. That's a promise. And he says in verse 24, Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. If you just are, have good courage and, and have that faith like Jonathan or Paul had, God says, I will strengthen your heart. So first tonight, I said, don't let pressure from the world make you regret from separating it. Time, hard times are going to come. The world's going to pressure you, especially if you're doing a lot for God. But don't let that make you regret separating from the world. Second tonight, look back at Exodus 14. Exodus 14, we'll keep reading in verse 13. Exodus 14, 13, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Second tonight is we should try to encourage those who are doubting. Here, Moses is dealing with these people uh, who he will be dealing with for a very long time. And when they're regretting, and they're doubting, and, and they're, they're afraid, he doesn't get mad or upset at them. He's patient, and he, he says, fear not. Don't be afraid. God's going to save you. God's going to take care of you. Turn to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. While you're turning there, I'll read you Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 that says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Part of a healthy church environment, and part of, this is the, part of the reason that uh, God instituted the local New Testament church is to have this environment where when you go through, when the world is pressuring you, when you are going through those hard times, it's an environment where you are being encouraged and you are also encouraging others as well. It's a, it's a mutual um, relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're there in Isaiah 35, look at verse 3. The Bible says, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say, to, is this... In, as we read verse 4, think about what Moses said to the Hebrews and how similar this is. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with the recompense. He will come and save you. Because people, people are going to doubt. People are going to go through hard times. You are going to go through hard times. People are going to get discouraged. And that's why you need a church like this. That's why people who, who are not part of a church they, they don't last very long because you only can go so long by yourself. You're going to quit. You're going you're gonna to give up on it when there's nobody else to encourage you and strengthen you 
and help you live the Christian life as well. Uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. So especially in a church like this, where, where it's a bunch of believers trying to, to fulfill the Great Commission, try to focus on, on strengthening those weak hands and encouraging those who are going through hard times, because we all do eventually. Ezekiel 34. And maybe not just discourage people either, but maybe people who are starting to uh, slip out of church or, or, or give up on God, try to encourage those people. Because a lot, a lot of times people just, they just need encouragement. They just need someone to uh, be there for them. Ezekiel 34, verse 4. The Bible says, The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which is broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which is lost, but with force and cruelty have ye ruled them. So this verse is mainly talking about spiritual leaders and pastors. However, I, you don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 27, 5 through 6 says, Open rebuke is better than seek your love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I, I do believe that there is a sort of a responsibility that comes along with being somebody's friend. I believe you're a pretty rotten friend if, if you claim to be someone's friend and they start getting discouraged and it, to the point where they maybe quit on church or, and just drop out of the Christian life and you never help them. You never encourage them and you were never there for them. Turn to 1 Samuel 23. For example, I don't want a friend of mine to get uh, discouraged or backslidden and think to myself, I, I could have done something about that. To think, I, the disease, have you not strengthened? I, there be, I healed that which was sick. If you see someone that's that's starting to be driven away, try to, try to bring them again, is what I'm trying to say. There, 1 Samuel 23, look at verse 14. 1 Samuel 23, 14, the Bible says, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. So, here in 1 Samuel 23, David is running from Saul. Saul is trying to kill David. Saul is after David. And notice verse 16, and Jonathan, remember Jonathan? Jonathan was also a, a great friend of David's. Verse 16, and Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, sound familiar? Fear not. For the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth. And they two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. So even in a time where David is going through something that really doesn't affect Jonathan, Jonathan is really unaffected by this, no one's trying to kill Jonathan, no one's after Jonathan, However, even though it really doesn't concern him or it's not affecting him, I'll say, he, he makes it a point to go to his friend who is going through that and, sh and spiritually strengthen him. To, it says he strengthened his hand in God. He, he encourages him, even though it really wasn't even something that he was going through himself. Turn to Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 21. So here in Acts 14, we're talking about Paul. And Paul is preaching in Lystra right now. And if you remember, this is when he healed somebody. He healed somebody, and uh, the people there, uh, they, they thought that they were gods when they did this. They had never heard of Jesus Christ or of the gospel. So they, they think, they assume that Paul and Barnabas and those who were with him are gods, and they actually start getting ready to sacrifice to them. And Paul preaches them the gospel, and he explains who Jesus Christ is, and we're not gods, and all this. And verse 18 says, And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came through their certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So the Jews come and stir everybody up. These Jews kind of just followed him around wherever he went, and stirred uh, stirred up those who he was preaching to, and they act, a mob takes Paul and they actually stone him to the point where they think he's dead. However, by some miracle or God, God keep, uh, being with Paul, Paul does not die. It says in verse 20, Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, 
he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So here Paul almost dies. He's stoned, an angry mob, mob takes him and almost kills him. And the first thing he does when he somehow survives is he goes back to Lystra and he encourages the disciples there. Amen. Those people had not been stoned. Those people were not attacked by an angry mob. He had gone through much more than them. However, he, the first thing he does is he goes and he exhorts them and he strengthens them and he, he, te he tells them to continue in the faith and that hard times are going to come. You don't have to turn there, but Hebrews 12, 12 says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Focus on lifting up other people. Turn to Acts 18. Just a few pages over Acts 18. We're also talking about Paul here. Acts 18, 22 says, And when he had landed... At Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all, over all the country of Galatia and Ferga in order, strengthening the disciples. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 3. Paul is always strengthening other people. And, and we see this in Acts. We see this in the letters he wrote. And what I find so ironic about this is Paul went through more than anybody else. Paul often went through much persecution and trouble than any of the people he was probably encouraging, but he, he had the, enough character to lay aside his own problems and just focusing, to focus on strengthening those who needed it. There in 1 Thessalonians 3, the Bible says this, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, this is, a, of course, a letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Wherefore, when we thought we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left to Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Here Paul mentions that he sent uh, Timothy all this way to the church here at Thessalonica just to comfort them, and just to make sure, just to encourage them and make sure they're doing all right. And you say, what's the point? Why do people need to be encouraged? Why is it such a big deal? Is it that big of a deal? Well, here's why. Look at verse 3. Here's, here's why... Paul focused so much on it. Verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereto. Again, this is why you need to be in a church because if, if you are not being, if there's no one to encourage you and there's no one for you to encourage, you're going to be moved by these afflictions. You're eventually going to quit. You're eventually going to drop out. It's just human nature. And look, skip down to verse 7. There's another aspect of here that I think is interesting too. Verse 7 says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. See, here's the dual effect. It's a dual effect of comforting someone because you encourage someone else. You lay aside your problems and you, you may have been stoned by an angry mob the day before, but you just kind of lay that aside and focus on encouraging other people and being the mature Christian, and then they are encouraged, and then that encourages you. Because few, few things are more encouraging than seeing other people go through hard times, and you encourage them, and then see them get that zeal back, and, and see them regain that, that zeal they had, and be encouraged. I didn't really originally have this in my notes, but turn to Romans 15. I thought this would be fitting. Romans 15. Romans 15, verse 1, read verses 1 through 3. Romans 15, verse 1 says this, We then, th this verse reminds me of Paul and kind of how he was. We then that are strong ought to, embear, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And here we see the ultimate example of someone who did this, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, for even Christ... Please not himself, but as is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell upon me. Jesus Christ was the ultimate example of this because he laid aside everything that he had to go through, who he didn't even deserve it, and he focused on giving us eternal life. Jesus Christ was not obsessed about himself and worried 
about himself. He was willing to die for the sins of the world, even though it was something he did not deserve to go through. Right. And it's the same, it's similar to us. When we, when we bear the infirmities of the weak, and we are putting aside our problems and what we go through, and like Paul, we're just always encouraging other people. Even though they maybe have not gone through what we've gone through, or maybe even if, if we've gone through more, Paul just laid that aside and he focused on encouraging other people. So first tonight I said don't let pressure from the world make you regret separating from it. Second I said we ought to encourage those who are doubting. Third tonight, uh, look to, look, go back to Exodus 14, we'll keep reading in verse 15. Exodus 14, 15. The Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of uh, in ver verse 18, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, because if you remember, God led them in the form of a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud uh, went from before their face and stood behind them. And then notice verse 20 here. It's also the verse on the front of your bulletin. Exodus 14, 20, And it came between the camp, the Egyptians, and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud in darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. So God causes sort of this, this special event here, this miracle, to where when the Egyptians look at God standing between them, they see darkness. However, the Israelites, who are right on the other side, they look at it and they see light the light that always was there guiding them, the, the light that guided them all the way to the Promised Land. I mentioned the title of the sermon was The Light, the Darkness, and the God in, and the God in Between. Is That's really what we have in this situation. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2. And even so, in the same way as when the, the world or the Egyptians looked at God and they saw darkness, and when the Israelites looked at it and they saw light, in the same way, even today, the Word of God... It's a light to us, but it's darkness to the world. For example, the Word of God, we just, there, you have those moments where you're just in awe of the Word of God, and it's just, the, the Word of God is so deep, and it's, it's it, we just see everything it, it can do in people's lives, and do in our lives, and, and we see, it's like the Bible says in John, how our hearts burn within us when we hear the words of God, and we hear the words of Jesus Christ, and we just can't get over the fact of how deep and how amazing the Word of God is, and how it's just a light to us every step of the way in our, in our life, no matter what we're going through. Amen. And yet, people may be at work, or unsafe family, they look at the same Word of God, and it's just pitch black to them. They don't get it at all. I, I was talking a while ago with, uh, with someone I know who's unfortunately not saved. And we were talking about the Bible, and he was kind of asking me about what I believe and things like that. And he said, you know, I tried to, I tried to read the Bible one time. I started out in the, in the first book, and it was like, in the beginning, God, and then it just lost me, bro. You see, that's how it is. It's... Maybe unsaved people can understand the, the basic ideas of the Bible. They can understand the surface ideas that Jesus died for our sins. But the, the, the deepness of the Word of God and the plan that is in here for our lives and how, the, how deep the Word of God is, it's darkness to them. Yeah, They're in 1 Corinthians 2.12. We're going to read these next few verses, and I want you to notice that there's going to be a compare and contrast here between us, something that we have, and something that the world does not have. Verse 12, Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See how, see how it's different? Verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man, meaning the unsaved man, the man without the Holy Spirit, the man without God, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? 
for they are foolishness unto him. They're darkness. He can't understand them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, we have a special understanding of the Bible because we have what's called the Holy Spirit. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but John 14, 26, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send to my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have told you. Jesus is mentioning that the Holy Spirit, that's what teaches you the Word of God, and that's what helps you understand and, and, and comprehend the deep things of the Word of God. This plan in here, we, we often talk about how the Word of God is will guide you through every scenario, every part of your life, the Word of God will guide you. And here we see that that's the Holy Ghost that does that. That is why. It, I think about it like this. I think about it, the world, because the world has a conscience, right? The, the world has that conscience, that ba basic understanding of right and wrong. It's kind of like if you're in a dark room and you pull out your phone and you turn on the little flashlight. And if you get really close to something, you can maybe make, it, make out what it is or see it. And then you have, that, that's like their conscience. And then you have, say, believers with the Holy Ghost, and it's like a spotlight. It's like a, a light that, that lights up the whole room. It's like the conscience is the light version of the Holy Ghost. And the reason that we can understand the Word of God, the reason that it's a light to us and a darkness to the world, is we have the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Ghost that allows us to understand it, but the world does not have that. That's why they are in darkness. That's why they do not understand. Turn to Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. And a lot of people kind of mess this up today. A lot of modern Christianity messes this up today because they teach salvation as like sort of this process, sort of this gradient where you come from darkness and then it gets a little lighter into light. You go from not being saved to being more possibly saved. And it's just this big confusing thing, whereas the, according to the Bible, you're either saved or you're not. You're either in darkness or you're in the light. Yeah, there in Ephesians 5, 8, the Bible says this, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You see, when you get saved, you, you, it's like when the Bible says you, you're passing from death into life. You're passing from one side to the other. You're passing from the darkness to the light. The, the hymn we're going to sing after uh, service tonight is hymn number 262. Take all your hymnals and look at it. I, I want to point out the words... Hymn number 262. Song number 262. The, the first, even this hymn, gets this idea across. In the first verse it says, The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. The third verse says, Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes, the light of the world is Jesus. Go, wash at his bidding, and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. You are either in the darkness or in the light. And you say, well, what's the application? What is, how does this apply to us? Well, let's go back to our story. Turn to Acts 26. Acts 26. So think about our analogy here. We have the, we have the, the, the light, the darkness, and the God in between. So there's the Egyptians on this side. They're in the dark. And the Israelites are in the light. So what eventually happened to the Egyptians? Later in the story, the Israelites cross over the Red Sea and dry land, and the Egyptians, they're eventually destroyed by God's judgment. They're eventually destroyed by God's wrath. Well, what happened to God's people? Well, they crossed over the Red Sea, and those who, were, who followed God and listened to him were led by God himself all the way to the Promised Land. They, they had that plan available for, for their life that God had for them. So you're there in Acts 26. The context is Paul, the apostle, is getting his testimony. He's, he's telling somebody about how he got saved and how uh, we're reading right now about Jesus Christ and what he said to Paul when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Uh, verse 16, Jesus Christ is talking to Paul. He says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So Jesus says, I have a plan for you, Paul. I've appeared to you for a purpose. I'm going to make you a witness. I'm going to make you a minister. I want you to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And you say, why? What's the point? Verse 18, to open their eyes. 
and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, why? That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So it's, we have the Egyptians that were eventually destroyed in the, in the Israelites that were eventually led by God safely. And it's no different in our world today. You have the, wor the, the world on this side, and if they continue down this path and they continue in the darkness, they will eventually die and go to hell and be destroyed by the wrath of God. Same with the Egyptians. On the other hand, we have us who are saved. And if we follow God's word and we follow God's commandments, we will eventually be led down the path that God has prepared for us in the word of God. And you say, what's the application? Well, really, if you think about the, the goal of our life, Jesus had this mission for Paul to open people's eyes, to get people saved, and turn them from darkness to light. It's no different for us. Because the majority of people are on this side. They're on the darkness side. They're lost and they're confused. And they don't, they don't know the wrath that is coming to them. Just like the Egyptians had no idea what was coming when God was going to judge them. And just, we just need to keep in mind that the goal of our life is to get people from this side over to this side. So they can have that Holy Spirit that, that unlocks this plan that God has for their life. And so God, because God, I believe God has a plan for everybody. I believe God, even every unsaved person out there, I believe God has a plan for their life. Now, most people uh, are not going to follow that. Most people aren't even going to start. They're not even going to get saved. But as long as people can, can come to this side, they have that ability to, to understand that. And like I said, it's the same mission for us. We have the light, the darkness, and the God in between. And on one side, they're going to be judged. And on one side, they have the ability to live a valuable Christian life. And so we should just remember to be doing everything we can. That the goal of our life, the reason we're here, is to get more people to come to that light. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.